to, to the correct diagnosis. So CT scan makes more sense rather than MRI, all the MRI gives you much uh, better picture. Now coming to pulmonary angiogram, gold standard, no doubt about it. Just like uh, coronary angiogram is a pulmonary angiogram is gold standard because you are going to directly inject dye into the pulmonary artery and see where is the site of the block. It is not commonly performed nowadays that is a invasive and better non-invasive techniques are available. Mortality high uh, of the procedure per se itself is 0.5 percent. You have to have uh, the NSA available with you, you have to have critical care specialist, you have to prevent any vasovagal reaction from occurring, so you have to be very careful while performing a pulmonary angiogram. Negative angiogram virtually excludes the diagnosis. It is most helpful when, ventricula when ventilation perfusion scan is negative and there is no evidence of DVT or ultrasonogram. Now this is the pulmonary angiogram, the picture which is present on your left side shows two arrows in which there are, you can see there are filling defects. These are because of clots which are sitting in the pulmonary artery. Now this patient has subsequently been subjected to catheter directed thrombolysis and embolectomy and you can see that uh, both the clots are gone and this must have been life saving in this patient because you had major obstruction. Now coming, once you have made the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism or strongly suspected it, now comes the management. Sorry, yeah. before going to the so management, this. once you describe very well the sign and symptoms as well as the investigation procedures. Right. Now it is depend upon the uh, the amount of the thrombolyzed uh, things uh, as well as the uh, where it is located, very true. depending on the uh, it produces sign and symptoms. So like you described the about severe symptoms like dyspnea, tachypnea and all these ECG changes. So is there any incubation period like once it is lost uh, within, is it the acute like whenever it is, it is lost into the pulmonary artery, immediately it will produce signs and symptoms yeah. or is it going to take some time depending upon uh, the condition? Very true. No, that is a good question. Actually, uh, this would present as a medical emergency. This will present to you emergency with acute onset breathlessness. So it will present as a medical emergency. The other entity which can present over a prolonged period of time is patients who have got chronic pulmonary thromboembolism, who have say some deep venous thrombosis and small amounts of fragments are embolizing gradually over a period of time. They will present over a period of months with chronic pulmonary thromboembolism. But if a patient has got an acute pulmonary thromboembolism, he is going to present to you in casualty with sudden onset breathlessness, unexplained. He has no history of asthma, there is no chest pain patient has not been at times immobilized also and patient has come with sudden onset breathlessness. You see the patient, he has got sinus tachycardia, he has got tachypnea and you find everything else is normal, ECG, the chest x-ray is normal, the ECG is showing you just a sinus tachycardia. Suspect pulmonary thromboembolism always keep, uh, keep it as one of a differential diagnosis. Do a serial ECG, in fact if patient if has acute coronary syndrome can have subsequent developing myocardial infarction, so at least do two ECGs which are temporarily apart in time. If the symptoms onset has been there for more than 4 hours, then you can do a, a cardiac troponin test by bedside because that will again help you to establish the diagnosis of ACS. So high index of suspicion is required, but patient will present acutely in emergency. Yeah. That definitely depends upon the degree of the, you know, the obstruction, obstruction which has occurred. Yeah. If the obstruction is very small, patient might just walk away and feel he had some breathlessness, then after that is totally fine. In fact, uh, the air the air travel associated pulmonary embolism, uh, a lot we'll be discussing the data subsequently. It's only patients who have massive pulmonary thromboembolism will present to you. Otherwise, getting up from the aircraft and patient has been sitting for a long period of time, feels a bit breathless, he might just overlook the symptoms. Now, coming to, uh, should we go ahead? Yeah, to the sure, part? sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, coming to the management part, uh, it really depends upon the degree of hemodynamic compromise. Uh, massive pulmonary thromboembolic patients are at a risk of cardiogenic shock. They should be treated very aggressively. Heparin and thrombolytic therapy are usually the treatments of choice. As far as the various invasive measures are concerned, which we shall be discussing subsequently, they are not so easily available. So the mainstay of therapy remains the heparin as well as the thrombolytic therapy. Now, since Massive pulmonary thromboembolism is, is an important, I thought we will cover it up more in detail. It is usually life threatening. It presents with abrupt onset critical illness and there is starting progressive clinical deterioration despite therapeutic levels of anticoagulation. The incidence of massive pulmonary thromboembolism has been found to be occurring about 4% of all cases of pulmonary thromboembolism. In the international cooperative uh, study uh, in which there were 2500 patients, about 4.2% had got massive thromboembolism. Uh, Patients usually present with arterial hypotension, cardiogenic shock, systolic blood pressure is below 90, 
or there has been a fall of at least 40 millimeters of mercury for at least 15 minutes. It carries a very high mortality, early mortality of as high as 15 percent. In fact, the degree of hemodynamic compromise is the most powerful predictor of mortality. If you go by this uh, study which was presented in Jack in 1997, if you see that if the patient had cardiogenic shock, the mortality is as high as 24.5 percent. If the patient had to be given CPR, mortality rates are almost reaching 65 percent. Whereas if the patient had only RV dysfunction and no arterial hypertension, the mortality would be 8.1 percent and if patient arterial hypertension is around 15 percent. So more the severe the degree of hemodynamic compromise, higher is the degree of mortality in massive pulmonary vulnerability. The initial management consists of, there are different regimens which are available for giving heparin but the most traditionally used is to give unfractioned heparin 10,000 units uh, as a bolus and then infusion of 1,250 units per hour to achieve an activated partial thromboplastin time of at least 80 seconds. IV fluid should be given, up to 500 to 1,000 ml of uh, IV fluid should be given. However, since there is RV dysfunction which is set in, one has to be very careful while giving the uh, fluids. Dopamine and dobutamine are first line anotropes. They increase cardiac output with incre without increasing pulmonary arterial pressure and thus decrease the PVR. Norepinephrine can be used. It increases cardiac output as well as systemic vascular resistance. In general, there should be a low threshold to initiate pressures. We should not wait to initiate them. If required, go ahead and start the dopamine and the dobutamine and if required, noradrenaline can be added. At times, alpha blockers might be required such as a phenylephrine. Now, fibrinolytic therapy, very important part of the therapy because easily available. It is a standard first line treatment, reduces the rate of death as well as recurrent pulmonary thromboembolism by 55 percent. Now, as far as this recurrent pulmonary thromboembolism is concerned, we shall discuss it later on, but it reduces the rate of death by 55 percent. That is really significant. But the large amount of doses are required. Prolonged treatment is required. That is why the major bleeding risk is doubled when fibrinolysis is given in massive pulmonary thromboembolism. Studies have shown that if only heparin were given, the chances of one bleeding were 12 percent. But if patient was given fibrinolytic therapy, the chances of bleeding are as high as 22 percent. Uh, now, coming to the role of thrombolysis. Now, since the thrombolysis will physically dissolve the clot which is obstructing, the right heart failure will be prevented because that obstruction is gone. Once you are given the fibrinolytic therapy, the obstruction has been taken care of and right heart failure will be prevented. It prevents the continued release of serotonin, neurohumeral factors from the clot surface which cause pulmonary hypertension. If you remember the slide we had discussed as far as the pathophysiology was concerned, there was one section which was dealing with the neurohumeral factors. So once the clot has been dissolved, the further release from the clot surface because of platelets of serotonin will not be there and pulmonary hypertension will not be caused. As far as the recurrence uh, thing was concerned, these thrombolytic agents, they help to dissolve the pelvic thrombi also and this pelvic thrombi might be a source of recurrent P. So the recurrent chances also become less. The very good thing about thrombolytic therapy in pulmonary thromboembolism vis-a-vis -vis thrombolytic therapy in acute MI is that the window period for giving thrombolytic therapy in pulmonary thromboembolism is 14 days. So you have a large window period, you can give thrombolytic therapy and it will be highly beneficial. It is not like an acute MI that you know it would only be beneficial in the first 2 to 3 hours or maximum 6 hours or maybe up to 12 hours. Here the window period is as long as 14 days. We have discussed about the definitions about the sign and symptoms like breathlessness, tachypnea and investigation like important investigation like ECG changes and pulmonary angiogram, CT scan, all these things.